Welcome to the recorded version of Understanding the Non-Motor and Psychiatric Features of Parkinson's Disease from April 29th, 2020. Brought to you by the American Society of Aging and a generous sponsorship from Right at Home. Our presenter this morning is Arita McCoy. Arita is a nurse practitioner at the Johns Hopkins Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center. She has worked at the center for 13 years in multiple roles, including as outreach assistant and research nurse. In her current role, Arita splits her time between clinical patient care and rating performing procedures in clinical trials. She serves as coordinator of the John Hopkins Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. And with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Arita McCoy, our presenter this morning. Welcome, Arita. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you for that really nice uh, introduction. Um, Steve is correct. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Parkinson Disease and Movement Disorder Center at Johns Hopkins. And um, what I do there is see a lot of patients who have um, neurologic conditions, but mostly Parkinson's disease. And that's going to be the focus of our talk today. Um, not just Parkinson's disease and, and what that can do to the body, but some of the non-motor uh, symptoms of Parkinson's that we don't technically see as the chief symptoms of PD, but end up being really important for us to know about throughout the disease trajectory. So um, that's the topic of our conversation today. So I thought we'd start off just by uh, discussing where we're hoping to go with this talk. Um, I hope to help identify um, and define some of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Also to help understand uh, the time points in the disease progression with respect to when we see these non-motor symptoms pop up. Um, and then also to just briefly discuss the treatment options that we have available um, and, and also talk about other specialists who we might refer to to discuss these problems as, as needed. Um, so I thought we first start off just by defining what a non-motor symptom is. And we know that non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease refer to those symptoms that don't necessarily affect movement, coordination, or mobility. We, we know that Parkinson's disease affects all of those things, but we're talking about these symptoms that might be a little bit separate from those cardinal motor features of PD. We also know that um, some of these non-motor symptoms are actually the major determinants of quality of life, also how people um, are disabled by their disease overall. Uh, these non-motor symptoms have a big part in, in regulating whether or not people will have uh, severe disease disability. Um, we also know that uh, non-motor symptoms are really um, important reasons that people end up being hospitalized because of their Parkinson's disease and may also need nursing home or other long-term care placement when these non-motor issues become difficult to manage. We don't really fully understand a lot about why people get these specific non-motor issues in Parkinson's disease, but we know that in Parkinson's, we're dealing with neurons that have slowly degenerated over time. Those neurons, um, you know, mostly affect the way that we move, but we think that the brain, you know, as it uh, tries to adapt for that low level of uh, movement uh, neurotransmitter, then some of these other parts of the brain may also be affected. And so because of that widespread loss, you know, with some of these non-motor symptoms seem to be happening in our patients um, pretty consistently. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, these non-motor symptoms, uh, some of them, quite, quite a few of them may not be traditionally seen. So these may not be symptoms that we can see or measure in our patients, but um, they, they tend to be bigger problems than those other motor symptoms that we can see and measure. And, and so it, it's really important that we understand what they are so we, we can deal with the problem. I also have a patient who has described Parkinson's as a salad bar disease. And, you know, um, as we all know, we can all attend a salad bar and we can all, you know, fix a salad a certain way, but it's likely that no two salads will ever be the same. And we see that that's true with Parkinson's disease and especially with the non-motor symptoms of PD, 
that even in families or in people who are diagnosed around the same time, we see that Parkinson's progresses very differently for each person. And so some of these symptoms might happen in some patients, all of them may happen in other patients, and some patients may not have as many or may have very few of them. And so it's really individualized, and, and so it's important that we educate on all of them so people know how to detect them. Um, some of the symptoms that we'll discuss today may or may not have effective treatment, and uh, it's important just to know that our goal is to treat all of these uh, disorders, but if there are some things that we don't have treatments for, we're talking patients through that so they understand how to work around or work with the issues that they, they may have. We even see that a select few of these non-motor symptoms may even occur before Parkinson's is diagnosed. And so that's something really important for research and other things that we'd like to do um, to understand a little bit more about why that's even happening. We tend to group non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease into four areas. Um, we see that dysautonomia is a very big issue in Parkinson's disease. This is the automatic part of our nervous system that's supposed to work without us having to uh, tell it to do that. We call that the autonomic nervous system. Uh, but we find that there is dysfunction there and the communication is, is off, presenting a lot of issues and problems in, in, in that, that area. We also see sleep abnormalities being very common uh, category for non-motor issues. We see issues with mood uh, and also cognition, thinking and memory is significantly affected in PD. So we'll talk a little bit more about how these categories split. We do know that these may happen during different times throughout the trajectory of the disease. And the next slide uh, talks a little bit about the early symptoms uh, of non-motor issues that people with Parkinson's can have. And some of these symptoms are prodromal. So before we even see any of the motor signs of Parkinson's, like the stiffness, the slowness, the increased tremor or shaking people may have. Before we even see some of those symptoms, we know that there are some non-motor prodromal symptoms that can happen first. Uh, the first is REM sleep behavioral disorder, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, the second is loss of sense of smell, uh, which has become a little bit more popular recently with COVID-19, um, as that's one of the symptoms that patients may experience with that respiratory disease, um, but that actually is a, a very common problem in early Parkinsonism that people may have reduced or complete loss of their sense of smell. Um, and so that's something that we're, we're very, very interested in and looking into for, for research purposes. Um, we also know that constipation is an issue for patients uh, maybe way prior to them being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And we know that 50% of our patients may have either anxiety or depression that's significant prior to being diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, so this is an area where we really hope to understand more about what then happens in the brain that makes the motor symptoms develop. And if we can figure that out, maybe we can slow or, or stop the progression of Parkinson's by identifying people who are at risk very early. Now, once Parkinson's is diagnosed and after the diagnosis occurs, we see that these non-motor symptoms tend to spread some. So that this autonomia category, we include, of course, constipation, but also issues with the bladder, so urinary urgency and frequency. We see trouble with temperature regulation, so heat and cold intolerance and increased perspiration uh, is common in our patients. We see difficulty with the communication between the brain and the heart, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about low blood pressure in Parkinson's and uh, changing positions, how that can be difficult. Um, also issues with sexual function, and we talked about smell. We also see that our patients complain of altered taste um, as they're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. The sleep abnormalities expand to not only include REM sleep behavioral disorder, but also insomnia, difficulty sleeping, excessive daytime sleepiness, and restless leg syndrome, which is very common in Parkinson's disease. 
We also see mood changes to also expand and involve impulse control disorder, uh, which can come as a side effect of medications that we use to treat Parkinson's disease. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we also see that cognitive issues tend to uh, become a little bit annoying for our patients. So um, slowness of their thought, which we call bradyphrenia, difficulty with short-term memory, and also multitasking, so doing more than one cognitive task at a time or combining a cognitive task with a physical task can be difficult for our patients. Uh, we also see some other symptoms, including fatigue, trouble with speech, uh, pain can be problematic in certain situations um, with Parkinson's disease. Also trouble with vision, so, so seeing double, um, and having trouble with handwriting, uh, chiefly small handwriting is something that we find is, is uh, difficult for our patients as well. Later in the progression of Parkinson's disease, so in the, the late stages of the disease, we see that these categories again expand a little bit more. Uh, dysautonomia actually can progress to significant difficulty with swallowing. Um, we also see drooling and assess excessive salivation can come um, from that automatic part of the nervous system. Uh, more problems with bowel and bladder, so incontinence, so not just frequency and urgency, but Incontinence can be a problem for people for multiple reasons. Um, and also constipation may progress to even become more severe and cause bowel obstruction and sepsis. So this is something that we're really concerned about um, in, in our patients because it can be fatal. Also, um, the mood and cognitive changes may expand to, um, you know, involve dementia, which is a little bit different from like an Alzheimer's dementia, but can come from Parkinson's disease. So we'll talk more about that. Um, also, we find that the, the brain also has difficulty processing things and may actually um, cause things to be seen or be heard that actually aren't occurring in the environment. And so that we call psychosis, but mostly see hallucinations and delusions um, can happen in later stages of Parkinson's disease. Also apathy, just the inability or indifference in, in life and in making decisions and in getting tasks done, just not having any sort of initiative or get up and go to get things done is, is a problem for patients later in the disease. Uh, the sleep disorders, we also see expanding to daytime sleepiness, um, inability to return to sleep once they wake up, so worsening of insomnia and then waking up frequent times in the evening. So that's kind of how we see these, uh, this, these disorders grouped together. Now, we know that we have these non-motor issues and problems. We've done a good job of identifying what they are. So what do we do about them? How do we treat them? And we'll talk more about that specifically with the individual disorders. Um, but we base the treatments on the symptoms that patients have and what's really bothering them and getting in the way of them, them living their lives. We also see that we're really trying to get a good communication system with not only the patient but their family um, because the family members or care partners may often be people who pick up on these non-motor signs and symptoms first and the patient may not realize that they're happening or how severe they are. We also know that it's important to have a comprehensive care team when we're talking about treating these non-motor issues, and we want to make sure that their care team is aware of what Parkinson's disease is and the best ways to treat it, what medications we can't use, and what things we need to consider in a population of people with this unique disease. Because people don't often um, oftentimes know what these non-motor symptoms are or know that they're coming from their Parkinson's disease, they're under-recognized, and then they're also under-treated because of that. And so education, what you guys are doing today, is the best way to make sure that we're really aware of what these things are and what to do about them, okay? Um, so now we'll talk a little bit more about these individual non-motor symptoms so that we can define them clearly, know how to detect them, and know a little bit about what treatments we have available. So in terms of sleep abnormalities, uh, one of the first things that we often see in Parkinson's disease is a sleep issue called REM sleep behavioral disorder, which we've 
already talked a little bit about. Um, but REM sleep behavioral disorder is actually a dysfunction of our fourth phase of sleep. We have stage one, two, and three, and then the fourth phase of sleep is REM sleep. And that's actually when our brains are the most active. Um, so during REM sleep is actually when we're dreaming. And when that happens, our body is actually, a, there's a switch that flips in our brain that paralyzes our body. So even though we're dreaming, we're not actually doing what's happening in our dream. But in Parkinson's disease, that switch does not flip um, spontaneously, uh, and that can cause, you know, REM sleep behavioral disorder to be a problem with people. So this can happen both in Parkinson's and can happen in people who do not have Parkinson's disease. Um, we see REM sleep behavioral disorder. What's interesting is that we see this present as usually what's happening in the dream. So if people are having a dream that they may be, be chased or that they're uh, participating in a certain activity, they're actually doing those behaviors while they're asleep at night. So their spouse or bed partner may find that they're flailing around in their sleep. They may fall out of bed. They may hit their spouse or, or bed partner. And that can be an issue, a safety issue. We also see that people with Parkinson's disease that have REM sleep behavioral disorder compared to people who don't have Parkinson's disease and have the same condition, our Parkinson patients tend to have more frequent and more violent behaviors while they're sleeping. So it's something that we really like to talk a lot about to make sure it's not a huge problem. How do we treat REM sleep behavioral disorder? So, you know, there are many ways that we can, you know, change around the bed environment so that we make sure that people are safe. So one of the things that we're talking to people about is making sure their nightstands are far away, their bed isn't too high off of the ground, um, you know, making those kind of adjustments. So if there is a problem, then we can deal with it. It won't be a big injury over the night hours. Um, we also have, you know, asked people to um, consider um, being in twin beds as opposed to one large bed because it tends to not disrupt the sleep partner as much if the beds are actually a little bit separate. Some people actually do sleep in different bedrooms, um, which could be helpful, but also may be an issue because then we don't know how frequent that behavior is occurring and, and how severe it is. There actually is a great um, medication that we use to treat this disorder that some people take at night before they go to sleep called clonazepam. We use it to treat anxiety and other disorders, but um, we know that using clonazepam in RBD, a small dose before bedtime, can help to turn on that switch that doesn't spontaneously turn on in our patients. And so we, we do have good treatment options for, for this problem. Insomnia is the second sleep condition that we see very commonly in our Parkinson patients. We define this as the recurrent difficulty falling asleep and also maintaining or staying asleep at night. Um, we think this is caused by a variety of different things, but our patients often have slow movements during the night. So, you know, you're not taking as much Parkinson medication at bedtime, and because of that, that can cause people to get uncomfortable. And we all know that when it's hard to get comfortable in bed, it's hard to fully relax and fall asleep. So we see that that's a, a cause of this. We also see that the sleep-wake cycle is impacted in our Parkinson patients. And um, we all get a natural rise in melatonin when we lay down to go to sleep at night, uh, which helps us to maintain our sleep. But that natural rise doesn't occur as spontaneously as we like in Parkinson's disease. So often, you know, we're talking with people about their sleep-wake cycle and how their sleep schedule looks. Um, we also know that sometimes pain from um, difficulty with dystonia, which can be a, a painful condition coming from Parkinson's that causes stiffness of certain muscle groups in the body may also be the reason that people don't have a great night's sleep. Also, the need to get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. This can be a, a big reason that people aren't fully sleeping or falling back asleep. So some of the things that we do to treat this issue uh, first is to take a look at the Parkinson medication regimen. Uh, sometimes if we strategically space the medicine out 
or deliver an overnight dose, an evening dose uh, of medicine before you go to sleep that can help with the symptoms that might be bothersome to people and, and, and prevent them from being comfortable. We may also treat uh, bladder disorder and that may help with maintaining sleep at night. Also supplementing with melatonin has been helpful in quite a few of our patients and because they are able to supplement um, that natural rise, then they tend to get a better night's sleep. So that's something that we also recommend to people that seems to have a low side effect profile. Excessive daytime sleepiness is the next um, sleep disorder that we see very commonly in PD. And um, we see that, th that this is defined as a disabling trend to either doze off or fall asleep in various circumstances. So you don't actually want to be falling asleep at that moment, um, but you, you tend to doze off or fall asleep spontaneously. And it's is very common in Parkinson's disease and can happen in up to 50% of our patient population. We, have, we know that excessive daytime sleepiness can happen even without Parkinson's disease. Um, so we have a lot of reasons that this can occur, but in PD specifically, we know that apathy can be a cause of this. Just that lack of initiative, that lack of drive um, can be very difficult for people to actually want to do activities. Um, and so that would make them, you know, maybe sleep or doze off when they should be doing something that's active. Some of the medicines that we use to treat Parkinson's disease may also cause um, sleepiness. And so that's something that we're talking with people about a lot. Um, sleep apnea is also very common in our Parkinson population. And so we're asking those questions. We're sending people for sleep studies to make sure that they're getting a good night's sleep and that that's not causing them to be tired during the day. Um, there's a medication that we use to treat Parkinson's disease, three medications that are in the group called dopamine agonists. And these medications can cause sudden sleep attacks. So out of nowhere, people can spontaneously fall asleep, which can be, you know, very dangerous in certain situations. So um, that might be a medication that we need to take a look at and adjust if people are complaining of more sleepiness. Um, and then also just poor sleep hygiene, not having a good sleep schedule or a good sleep environment can also significantly cause daytime sleepiness to happen. So this is really important for us to know about so we can take a good history of the problem, try to figure out what exactly the source of the sleepiness is and treat that specific problem. Everyone having regular schedules is super helpful to avoid this from happening. So trying to do the same thing as much as possible every day. Um, and then being very stimulated during the day, making sure you're planning time to be active, to do things that need to get done around the house can of course prevent daytime sleepiness because of the engagement. Now the last uh, sleep issue that um, is really big issue with our Parkinson population is fatigue. And fatigue is a very difficult issue for our patients because, again, it can have multiple sources, of multiple varieties of issues. But we know that our patients who have fatigue tend to have it worse as the disease progresses. So in the early stages, they're doing pretty well. They can make it through their workday, but they have a symptom that might be bothersome to them, like they shake or they're stiff. Uh, but then as Parkinson's progresses over the years, fatigue can be a bigger problem and more difficult to shake off. Um, we also know that if patients have low blood pressure, which we'll talk more about, uh, that that can cause them to feel really tired, just not have the power that they need to get through each day. We also know that depression or, or mood problems can be um, masters of fatigue, so we're talking a lot about that. And then if people have excessive daytime sleepiness or they're not sleeping well at night, not only will they doze off, but they'll also just feel more tired during the day. So with this, again, we're talking about sleep hygiene. We're talking about treating depression if we haven't already, and if that's a big reason why people have fatigue. Um, we're also adjusting Parkinson medications if we find that they are the culprits in causing these problems. Uh, maybe actually adding medication can help people to have more dopamine available and help with the 
uh, fatigue that they may experience just because of, of motor worsening. Also, we're talking about increasing the water that people are drinking and managing their blood pressure if they have low blood pressure so that we can make sure that that's not the cause of this disabling fatigue. So the next category we'll talk a little bit more about is dysautonomia. Again, that automatic part of our nervous system, the autonomic nervous system that works without us telling it to work, we see has some dysfunction in many ways in Parkinson's disease. One of the most common uh, dysautonomia issues that we see is actually orthostatic hypotension. In Parkinson's disease, we see that the body's natural reflex mechanism that causes our blood pressure to adjust automatically is dysfunctional. So there's a communication problem between the brain and the heart. And that can cause low blood pressure to happen when people change positions. So oftentimes when people are laying down in bed, they're feeling great, or if they're sitting in a chair, they're okay. And then they go to stand up. They may feel dizzy. They may feel lightheaded. They may feel like they want to pass out. Um, and we see that if we measure their blood pressure in each of those three scenarios, that the blood pressure is the highest and most stable while the patient is laying down. But then when they go to stand up, the blood pressure drops. And not only does it get lower, which is what we expect, but it doesn't recover from that as quickly as it should. And when people have this issue, they feel very dizzy. They feel like they need to sit down right away so that they can kind of catch themselves. And they have fatigue. And the fatigue is difficult because, you know, we, we need the blood to perfuse throughout the whole body, and we rely on the heart to help that process happen. And when that's not happening the way it should, it makes us more tired. We also see that this happens with exercise. Uh, so if people are working out really hard and they're losing lots of fluid um, through sweat, then this problem is worse. Some people have it because of meals. When they're very full and their body has to work hard to process food, this problem can be a lot worse. And also if you're in temperature extremes, so very hot conditions or very cold conditions can also affect how this orthostatic hypotension reacts in your body. So how do we treat this problem? Um, first thing is we're making sure that that's what's going on. So we'll have you measure blood pressure consistently in these different positions to see if this actually is what's going on. Um, we also will have people come off of high blood pressure medication. A lot of the times people have had hypertension for years and then they're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and they've just been on those medicines for a long time. But the medicines that we use to treat Parkinson's disease also lower blood pressure. So we see that we have less need for those antihypertensives as PD develops. So we're talking with the primary care doctor or cardiology about ways to minimize the amount of medication that people take for blood pressure. We also are talking with people about their diet. Uh, increasing fluids and increasing salt in diet can help with retaining water, and that can help with raising the blood pressure. Um, sometimes salt tablets that you can, you know, use as a supplement may also help to increase how much uh, fluid is retained in the body, but we use those very cautiously in, in our Parkinson population. We also know that people who wear compression stockings or compression socks may have less of that immediate pooling of blood down into their legs and in their feet when they go to stand up, and it's more of a gradual process. And so those can really help with the, the symptoms of hypotension. There is a medication that was FDA approved specifically for use in Parkinson's disease, orthostatic hypotension, and that medication is called droxydopa or Northera. Um, there are other medications that we use to treat this problem as well, but Northera was one that was specifically developed for the Parkinson's disease population. So that's a medicine that we tend to see used in our community a little bit more than others. The next uh, part of dysautonomia that um, is very common in Parkinson's disease, probably the most common dysautonomic symptom is constipation. 
we define constipation as difficulty emptying the bowel. And that's more uh, than, I'm sorry, fewer than three times weekly. So if you're passing your uh, stool less than three times a week, we define that as constipation. Um, in advanced Parkinson's disease, this can progress significantly to a dangerous problem called bowel obstruction, where no matter what you do, you can't pass your, your, your bowel. And um, that can cause uh, bacteria to back up in the bloodstream and, and cause bigger problems if we don't address it right away. We know that this is caused by the slowing of the GI tract. So in Parkinson's disease, it's difficult for the bowel to move spontaneously the way that it should because, again, of that communication problem. So um, we also know that our patients tend to drink less fluids because they don't want to have to get up and move a lot more. They already have trouble with their movement. So because of that, that reduced fluid and dehydration can make bowel problems worse. Also not having great activity levels or exercising can make constipation worse. We see some of the Parkinson's disease medications that we use, like anticholinergics, can cause constipation to be a bigger problem. Um, and so we're looking at the medication history. We're looking at things that you're doing in your regular life, and we're also looking at your diet. And we're trying to figure out in any of those areas how we can tighten things up or adjust what you're doing to make your constipation less of a problem. We also have some great medications that we use to treat constipation, um, two of which are relatively new to um, the, the GI market, uh, Linzest and Amatiza or Amtiza. Um, these medications have been helpful in patients who have very severe um, constipation that can't be regulated in other ways. We also tend to uh, recommend that our patients try Miralax. Um, daily or every other day as it helps to pull water into the bowel and that helps the bowel to move. Um, we know that there are other things like stool softeners like Colace and Senna um, that can help with this process, but we find that bulk is not really the problem in our population. It's more of the movement or motility that can be an issue. And so the medications that we choose tend to be ones that help that motility process and so that that's easier for people. The next uh, issue that we see very commonly in Parkinson's disease is problem with the bladder. And the bladder can be um, impacted in a variety of ways, but we know that the nervous system, the central nervous system, um, so that's the, the part of the, the um, nervous system that involves the brain and the spinal cord, is responsible for relaxing and contracting certain muscles with our bladder that actually help the bladder to release spontaneously. So we have smooth muscle, we have striated muscle, and we have our detrusor. And these three things must work in tandem for spontaneous bladder release to happen. We see that there can be an interruption in the way that the nervous system is communicating, and that can cause dysfunction at any of these levels, with smooth muscle, with striated muscle, and with the detrusor. And so when those muscles are affected, we see that people can have a variety of problems, um, first being urinary incontinence. So once the signal gets to the brain, uh, to the body that, that you got to release, that happens really quickly, and it can cause an accident to happen or incontinence to happen. We also see that people may have urinary frequency. So because the signal is interrupted or not communicating clearly, you may think that you have to go to the bathroom and your bladder is full, but you get there and you, you only empty your bladder a little bit. And that's what we define as frequency, having to go to the bathroom frequent number of times in the day, more than normal. Um, we also see that hesitancy can be a problem. So you get to the restroom, but you can't release your bladder like you'd like to. And um, that can be an issue because, you know, it can take a long time to release the bladder or bacteria can back up in the bladder because it hasn't been released the way that it should or as frequent as it should. 
So this is an important part of uh, the Parkinson disease process where we're pulling in advice from our colleagues in urology. Um, urology is great because some of these problems can just happen because of, you know, the aging process or other issues or problems with mechanical concerns in our bodies. So women, um, as women go through menopause and, and change with the way that their bladder works, and how their bladder communicates with their body, with gentlemen, how prostate issues can be uh, a part of this and, and may result in some other issues or problems that we want to treat separate from Parkinson's disease. Um, that may be things that we need to make sure our urology colleagues are checking out before we're only thinking that this is a communication problem. So we heavily rely on our colleagues, but we also start medications that can be helpful for people in dealing with urinary issues. Um, what's also very important to know is that some of the medications that we use to treat urinary problems can affect the way that the Parkinson's disease is actually progressing or the symptoms are appearing in the body. And so we're very cautious with using these medications and try to use the lowest dose possible to avoid any interactions or additional problems. The last thing that we'll talk about uh, with dysautonomia is excessive drooling or salivaria. Um, and so we see that this is a big problem for people as Parkinson's progresses. Number one, because the swallowing ability can be reduced the longer that someone has Parkinson's disease. We also see that their posture can cause some difficulty with um, bringing the saliva to a place that they can easily swallow it. And so we see that this can be an issue for people daytime or evening, um, especially when they're asleep at night. And we try to treat these issues by using medications that might dry the secretions. So there's some oral medicines that we may use. There are some topical medications that we may use to treat this problem. Um, we may also do injections of botulinum toxin into the salivary glands, which can slow the production of saliva. Um, we also are talking a lot to speech therapy at this time to make sure that this isn't coming from a bigger swallow problem that patients have, um, and we're relying on them to help us strengthen those muscles and the patients to actually do the exercises that can also improve how well they swallow and how much saliva they clear. Um, so those are the ways that we kind of try to manage these problems, but this problem can be a little bit difficult to treat with just medication or just with injections. It can be something that, that is a big quality of life problem for people, so we're talking to them a lot about this issue. So now we'll talk a little bit about cognitive disorders that we see commonly happening in Parkinson's disease. We see them happening on a continuum. And so um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about what I mean by that, but we see that cognitive disorders and mild cognitive impairment tend to affect very narrow aspects of our memory and thinking. And so that's kind of on one end of the spectrum. But then we have dementia, which is on the other end of the spectrum, and that tends to affect intellect more globally. So maybe not having a problem in one small area or two small areas, but having problems in three or four areas. And that can cause difficulty with people functioning independently in life. They often need to have assistance from others when these cognitive problems get a lot worse. Um, this slide shows um, a, a group of individuals with Parkinson's disease who had a normal test result on the mini mental state examination. So normal is defined as greater than 24. And even though patients were, were scoring greater than 24 on the mini mental state exam, we still looked at them from a cognitive perspective to see if they had any cognitive changes if they were reporting any cognitive symptoms, or if they already had a cognitive disorder. And as you can see, out of all the patients that we, we looked at in this study, only 12 of them with a normal uh, mini mental state exam truly had no cognitive change. The rest of the patients that were in the study actually had either cognitive changes ranging from just mild issues with word, verbal fluency or short-term memory, 
all the way through to dementia, even with a normal mini mental state exam. So we know that cognitive dis dysfunction happens in Parkinson's disease, and it happens in people who don't even complain about it. We see that about 24 to 36% of our patients without dementia has some sort of cognitive difficulty. And we know that with Parkinson's disease, we can have what's called Parkinson's disease dementia, and we see that that can happen up to six times greater in people with Parkinson's disease than it can happen in the general population. So that means that Parkinson's is doing something to the way that our thinking and memory is spontaneously happening in our brain, and it's causing these cognitive problems more than they would without a Parkinson's disease diagnosis. We know that people who have an increased risk of dementia tend to be older when they have Parkinson's disease, so they tend to either get diagnosed later or live a longer life with PD, and they tend to get dementia more than others. Um, and then also people who have very severe motor symptoms tend to have more difficulty with their cognition and may have dementia. We also see that executive dysfunction is a very common cognitive problem in Parkinson's. So executive dysfunction um, is when the higher level mental processes that we need to do things like plan, organize, to sequence tasks, things that are very complicated, like in, in terms of everyday living, if we can consider something like planning to move your house and how much coordination that requires and how much you know, foresight you have to have. These kind of tasks tend to be difficult with our Parkinson's disease patients as the disease progresses. It can be difficult to shift also between tasks or to multitask. So if I ask a person to do something and do something else in tandem, it's more difficult to do them both than to just do one or the other by themselves. And that becomes worse as Parkinson's progresses. Um, the main areas that we see cognitive dysfunction in are, number one, short-term memory. Number two, word finding, just difficulty getting the words out during conversation. Also, intellectual processing. We see problems in attention and also in the way that you perceive things in the environment, how you see things. So how do we adjust for these problems? We try to make adaptive strategies. We try to have people make notes, use calendars remember their medications with pill boxes instead of trying to spontaneous, spontaneously remember things. We actually also tell people that it's really important to be cognitively active, so doing things that challenge your brain, crossword puzzles, reading, Sudoku, even adaptive apps that you can do on the computer or on your phone can help to sharpen cognition. Um, we know that speech therapy is helpful with this as they do cognitive exercises. Um, and we also may do a neuropsychological evaluation to make sure there's nothing else happening other than Parkinson's disease that's causing thinking and memory problems. Um, we do use medications to treat these issues in PD. Um, Exelon is the only medication that we have approval for in Parkinson's disease, but we do use other memory medications, memory enhancing medications to see if they are helpful in certain areas. The last thing that we'll talk about today are the mood disorders that can come in Parkinson's disease. And we see these uh, separating into four areas, uh, anxiety, depression, impulse control disorder, and psychosis. And so I'll briefly talk about each of these and, and what's unique about them in Parkinson's. Uh, we see that anxiety is more of an issue in Parkinson's than in the general population. About 50% of our patients have anxiety at some point in their life. And we think that that's worse because of what Parkinson's does to the brain. We know that because uh, the medications that we use to treat Parkinson's can also help people with their movement, if their medication is not adequately titrated, that can make their anxiety worse. And so if they're, you know, dealing with the fact that they know that their meds are going to wear off, um, they may feel more anxious or have a lot more anxiety. So it's really important that we make sure that the medications that we're using are actually not causing that problem to be worse in our patients. We, of course, want to make sure that we know why people are anxious. So 
This is a time where we're also pulling in our psychiatry colleagues who can talk with them about their past, about how these, the anxiety has been for their life and whether or not it's gotten worse with the Parkinson's disease. We also want to try to incorporate cognitive things, behavioral things like exercise, like therapy, and all supportive interventions. And if none of those things happen or help us, then we want to consider adding medication. But it's really the combination of all of those things, not just medication that tends to help with both anxiety and depression in Parkinson's disease. Talking a little bit about depression, um, we see that people with Parkinson's disease do have uh, depression. About 50%, again, of patients may have some form of depression as they're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And we see that when people do have depression, that's associated with more disability, worsening quality of life, increased caregiver distress, and also more rapid progression of their Parkinson's disease. So if we are not adequately treating depression, we are not adequately treating Parkinson's disease. And we see depression presenting in a lot of ways, more than just being sad. People may not have interest in their activities. They may feel like they're a burden on others, and they may feel like they have a lack of motivation, energy, reduced libido, reduced appetite, sleep problems like we've discussed. And so we don't see traditionally people complaining of being sad, but we may see these other things that are big quality of life issues that we want to make sure that we're talking about if we're concerned about depression. Again, treatment of depression is very similar to treating anxiety. It's not that just medication will work or just therapeutic interventions will work. It's more of the comprehensive combination of all of those things that tend to make our patients better. We do know that exercise is very important for Parkinson's disease in general, but exercise can also treat depression. And so we are making sure that we're talking with our patients all the time about this. Um, PT and OT can be helpful in deciding what exercises are best. And then, again, we're talking about those supportive things like psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, supportive therapy, and then also considering adding medication to help balance the serotonin networks in the brain, which we know can be impacted by Parkinson's disease. Impulse control disorders, we'll talk about just briefly, um, but we know that these are very common in Parkinson's disease when we're talking about a medication group called dopamine agonists. And these impulse control disorders basically are behavioral disturbances where people can't resist the drive to behave in ways that might impair them socially or occupationally. So we see these happening in Parkinson's disease in a variety of ways, but the most common things that we see are excessive spending or shopping, hypersexuality, pathological gambling, and also eating, which is not on this slide, but we also see um, excessive eating. And these are all normal behaviors that we all may do at one point in time or the other, but because they're doing, our patients may be doing them extremely frequently or cannot resist the urge to do those things, that's when we can classify it as impulse control disorder. So it's when those normal behaviors become bad behaviors, when they're happening too frequently or too often and they're detrimental. We know that these medications, the dopamine agonists, can be part of the reason that this is a lot worse for people, um, but we have no way to predict what patients are going to get impulse control disorder. We see that more likely people who are younger when they get Parkinson's, obviously people who take these medications, and people who have some of these other issues with their mood may have ICD more than others. So those are the people that we're, we're talking to everyone about it, but we're paying really special attention to that population of people. We tend to just adjust medications, especially dopamine agonists. We may have to eliminate them or, um, you know, increase how much levodopa people take so that they are not getting the negative side effects from those agonists. Um, and we also want to make sure that we're putting behavioral measures in place so that we know if the ICD is becoming a problem again, 
and how we can start to talk about ways to treat it. Um, there's been a study that maybe adding a low dose of quetiapine or seroquel may help to control this pharmacologically, uh, but we don't have a really great treatment for this problem uh, in Parkinson's disease without getting rid of those, those medications that can cause it. Okay, the last thing that we're going to talk about um, involves psychosis in Parkinson's disease. And this is an important concept because psychosis um, may happen because of the medications that we use to treat Parkinson's disease, but may also happen in people who don't take any medication for Parkinson's disease. So we know some of it comes from the meds, but a lot of it may also just come from the disease itself. Um, psychosis uh, can be hallucinations or illusions, um, but it can also be delusional behavior. Hallucinations are more common. We see them happening in about 15 to 40 percent of people with Parkinson's disease who are treated with medication, and about 5 percent of patients may experience delusions in addition to those hallucinations. Seeing things that aren't there is how we define hallucinations. Delusions is thinking things that aren't actually happening or true. This is a very common cause of people with Parkinson's disease being hospitalized. Um, and this has got a huge impact on the family. Um, it certainly can increase caregiver burden. It can increase how much people need help or assistance with tasks. And it may also be the reason that people have to get into long-term care if we can't well regulate this problem. Um, and so we have a couple of risk factors to identify when this may be a problem for people, but mostly we know the longer people take Parkinson medication and the older that they are, the more likely that this can happen. Um, we also know that other medications or interactions with other medications may cause this problem. So it's really important that we know a lot about the history and about what's happening or new and recent and changed that we can figure out where this uh, psychosis may have come from. Um, we have people who have psychosis um, that can be categorized into two areas, people who have insight and know what's happening and know that what's happening is not reality, and then other patients who don't know that it's not real and it's causing a big quality of life problem. And so, um, you know, we want to make sure that if you're not, you don't have insight that we're treating this right away because we see that that can progress to a lot worse of a state a lot quicker. How do we treat psychosis and Parkinson's? Um, so the, the first thing that we're doing is making sure that there's not any infection or other medical problem that's causing psychosis to occur. We're checking labs, we're doing chest x-rays, we're looking at urinalysis, just to make sure that there's nothing else that could have caused this psychosis acutely or right away. We're also talking about vision. You know, sometimes people will complain about seeing things that aren't there, but they actually do have a vision problem um, or double vision, like we, we commonly see in PD, and they'll grab for things that aren't actually there. We also look at medications to see if something else that you might be taking has caused the psychosis. Um, there is a, a medication that was FDA approved specifically for Parkinson's disease psychosis called Nuplazid or Pimavanserin. Um, again, we have other medications that treat psychosis, but this one was developed specifically for people with Parkinson's disease um, and, and tends to not cause negative side effects um, as, as much as some of the other medications that we use to treat this problem outside of Parkinson's disease. Uh, so that's a common medicine for this problem. There is one medication called Haldol or Halperidol that is grossly contraindicated in Parkinson's disease and absolutely should not be used at all um, and should be avoided in all situations. So we like to make sure that people are very well aware of that. Um, so we've reviewed all of our non-motor uh, issues in Parkinson's disease on a, a high level. Um, it's just important to know that these are issues and problems so that we know that we need to treat them. So making sure that people are aware that this could be a problem and, and what we need to do is a big part of this process. So thank you guys so much for thinking that this is important and educating yourselves on it today. Um, I'd like to stop there and, um, you know, take time for questions. I know we, we may not have a lot of time left, but I'd like to answer any questions that are out there.
Okay. Thank you very much, Arita. Great presentation, really important information. Um, yes, we've got time for a couple uh, quick questions here, so let's, let's jump into it here. Um, first question for you, can you please review how PD is diagnosed? So many of the symptoms could also be indicative of other diseases as well. It would be helpful to know how PD is diagnosed. Yeah, PD is diagnosed, um, it's a clinical diagnosis, uh, often by a healthcare provider that can identify that you have three, uh, two out of three cardinal symptoms. So tremor, um, stiffness, and slowness, we call those bradykinesia and rigidity. You have to have two out of those three symptoms to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So that needs to happen before we even talk about any of these non-motor symptoms. Um, there are some scans and other tests that we can do, but we tend to rely on our clinical skills to diagnose Parkinson's in most of our patients. Okay, thank you. Next question, Arita. Um, as depression and anxiety are often present in the aging population, how do you determine if it is the sign of oncoming Parkinson's disease? Uh, the same question holds true for some of the other non-movement symptoms that may occur prior to onset of the disease. That's correct. And so that's a big area of research. We don't know why people who have anxiety and depression historically end up getting Parkinson's more than the general population. And because they can happen for a variety of reasons, we can't say that everybody that has anxiety or depression will get Parkinson's. So we don't know a lot about that, but it is so common that we know that there must be something that's happening in the brain that's causing that to happen in the Parkinson population more than just in the general community. We also know that some of those other non-motor signs and symptoms, especially REM sleep behavioral disorder, tend to have a really big conversion rate to Parkinson's disease. So the Michael J. Fox Foundation is actually studying smell and uh, that sleep disorder, REM sleep behavioral disorder, to find out how many of those people who have these conditions end up getting Parkinson's so that we'll know a little bit more about who we need to look at and what we need to do to treat the problem early. Okay. Um, Arita, earlier we were talking about melatonin, so this question is related to that. Does melatonin interfere with other medications a person is, take, is taking, for example, uh, Vesicare or Ativan, which are taken at night? Yeah. Melatonin is actually pretty well tolerated. It tends not to interfere with other medications. We make melatonin naturally. We're just supplementing it or adding it to people who need a little bit more. Um, we, we do, though, want to make sure that the dosing is, is uh, adequate, so we usually start people at a lower dose and may increase it to the level that, that's safe for them, but also is giving them some symptom relief. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Um, do you have any suggestions if someone refuses to get diagnosed or to see a doctor about symptoms? Yeah, um, I think that with Parkinson's disease, the interesting part of it is that um, it's very visible and it's very, um, it, it can impact quality of life significantly. And so people tend to not want to deal with or know that they, that, that they have it when the symptoms aren't bothering them. But as the symptoms progress and as it becomes more and more difficult to live life and as, you know, you may need assistance with getting through tasks that you used to do quickly, independently. I think that people tend to get frustrated with their motor symptoms and then, you know, may say themselves, look, I need to get something done about this. I just encourage people who are hesitant to know that even if we know that you have Parkinson's disease, it doesn't mean that we need to treat it the way that everyone else's Parkinson's disease is treated. If we know that it's a problem, we'll, we'll know what to expect, and then we can deal with the symptoms as they come. But I wouldn't want anyone to think that because they know how Parkinson's went for someone else that that's going to be the way it is for them. It could be very manageable the earlier that we know about it and the more that we get a good care team in place. Okay. Well, Arita, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our hour here, and we are just about out of time. But I want to thank you for joining us today on a, pre on a really important presentation of a topic that's very important to me as well, personally. So thank you for being here with us today and sharing your knowledge. Thanks so much. Thank you.